Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay. okay, great. Great. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed what you've seen so far. Um, it's amazing, isn't it? Amazing what, uh, what's being done with AI and amazing what's being done with our, our partnerships. Um, I have uh, a very special uh, privilege of being here with two uh, incredible people. I feel like which one of these three doesn't belong? <laughs> <laughs> two presidents um, of two of the most prestigious and oldest technological universities uh, in the United States and the world. President Shirley Ann Jackson from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and President Raphael Reif from MIT. Um, <laughs> I, I thought about reading their CVs, but I said, no, we'd be here all night if I did that, because each one of them is, is yay thick uh, with the recognition and awards they've gotten. But I thought I would just, rather than do that, just tell a quick story about something these uh, two incredible people have in common. And it has to do with their personal uh, tenacity to get things done. And I'll start with President Jackson and tell the story of when um, I called her one day and said, you know, I think we ought to think about putting a, maybe a supercomputer at RPI of this scale. And her response was, yes, I'll take it. When can I have it? And that's not big enough. <laughs> and, that, and that evolved into a challenge from President Jackson. She said, I will build the building and have it ready before you can build that computer. <laughs> and she won. <laughs> And with Raphael, I'll tell the story of uh, my initial call right after um, 4th of July. And I said, uh, you know, I have an idea. Maybe we ought to collaborate on a large scale in the area of, of AI, artificial intelligence. And it, it, I didn't, didn't even finish my sentence. And he said, that's a great idea. Let's do it. <laughs> and uh, you said, well, when can we get it done? This is so different than norm, no, dealing with normal uh, academic institutions. And um, I said, well, you know, how about 60 days? And he said, how about 30 days? <laughs> so they, what they have in common is bigger, faster, let's get it done. Uh, which is really, frankly, why we're here this evening is uh, mostly to celebrate um, the IBM industry academic partnerships because uh, we firmly believe that these are differentiators not only for our company but for these these great institutions so I thank you both for you. for joining you. Thank you. Um, now I will also tell you that each one said please ask the other one the tough questions so I decided to be safe I'll ask you both the same questions uh, to, 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 uh, to get on with this okay so uh, this is an open discussion we'll we'll probably do this for 30 40 minutes and then think about your own questions because we're going to come back to you um, to ask uh, any of us, any of us questions. So um, President Jackson, I'll, I'll start with you, with, which is the field of AI is artificial intelligence. It's been around for a long time. You know, I know in our research labs in the 50s and 60s, we were building computers to try to play checkers, and then we build a machine to play chess, and then we built uh, Watson. But there's been, you know, these cycles of trying to make AI work and do something. Um, why? Why now? What is different now that says this isn't just a passing fad? The things these folks saw outside. This is the real deal. Well, as you know, uh, things have kind of gone in fits and starts. Uh, uh, you know, the term artificial intelligence was really coined back in the fifties. I think around nineteen fifty-six. Um, I won't tell you whether I was here or not on the Earth <laughs> at that time. <clears throat> But in a sense, one could say it overpromised and underdelivered. That's right. But I think things have changed uh, because of a couple of factors. Uh, first, uh, fundamental advances in artificial intelligence, deep learning, things that uh, have affected things on the perceptual level, uh, whether you're talking, um, you know, uh, computer vision speech recognition or, mm -hmm. you know, image processing, natural language processing, and, and things on what you might call the associative level where, uh, you know, one is able to take uh, data from heterogeneous mm -hmm. uh, sources in various forms and be able to create, uh, as you well know, ontologies and, mm -hmm. and uh, knowledge uh, 
graphs and networks to be able to uh, discern patterns and 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 learn things from complex data sets. And that with uh, the deep learning that allows one to take data from uh, uh, sensors and with the advent of the Internet of Things, or what I prefer to say, the intelligent Internet of intelligent mm -hmm. things as one thinks about edge computing and the like, you, you now have the situation where you know, there's there's real progress, and people are even now beginning to put uh, the ability to reason into uh, uh, agents, and that and juxtaposed with the opportunity sets that have to do with uh, human health and and welfare, with national security, global security, with uh, challenges with climate and climate change, and so on. Then I think this is the moment, and. Um, and that's I real. think that's where we are, Mr. Real. Yeah. Raphael, what's your, what's your view on that? I mean, some of the very, some of the very, some of the very, very early, no, some, of the, some of the earliest work was, <laughs> was actually, well, I'm going to try to get these two to disagree on something. <laughs> um, some of the earliest fast. work on AI was done at MIT. Uh, I'm famous for that. Um, and so what is the momentum now at, at MIT and some of your other partners around AI? Yeah. Just two things before I start. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to be invited. I'm, I'm delighted by the partnership we have with IBM and, and Jonna. We, we owe you for that, for that phone call. Uh, but I also want to say that, that I'm just thrilled to be here sitting in front of you with Shirley Jackson. She's someone that I have admired all my career. Uh, I don't know whether you know, but she's an MIT hero heroine. Uh, uh, if, you, if you go and walk the MIT corridors, the Infinite Corridor, you'll find there is a wall dedicated to her. And we, someone we admire, and I have admired her all my life. And my role each time I appear with her in any event is to introduce her. <laughs> <laughs> and then I sit down. This is the first time, the first time that I'm with her in front of you. So I'm delighted to be here. Uh, on, on your question, I agree with you. Let sure. me just interject. It's a mutual admiration. <laughs> you know, Raphael's been my hero for a long time. And, Very kind. And, and we've been friends for a long time. Thank and you. I'm the ultimate conflicted person. MIT grad, Rensselaer president, <laughs> you know, MIT trustee. I'm a member of the MIT corporation. You know, uh, we have a few little IBM connections here, but we won't go there. <laughs> but Just thank think you. of it. I'm here talking in front of you, in front of my boss. <laughs> <laughs> I don't win. So, 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 so look, I, on, on your question, John, I think Shelley's right. I mean, this uh, and what you said is right. The ideas that that uh, that we're using today, many of the ideas that we're using today on AI, were were. Uh, came up from right. 30, 40 years ago. And and, uh, and 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 we can do it now because the computation power now allows us to do it. But, but I think the interesting thing is that, that the field went through a dormant period because the great ideas of 30 years ago couldn't be implemented. <clears throat> so people stopped working on that, the funding stopped coming to it. But now the ideas are being implemented and they are making a revolution. They're being used all over the place. But I think what's important, and this is what John Reckoness and Shirley does too, is that we cannot stop with the ideas of 30 years ago. So we have to keep right. working on human intelligence and understanding that to come up with the next kinds of algorithms for the future. So there is plenty to do and plenty to go with the present state of affairs because it hasn't penetrated uh, the economy and society as much as it will, but we have to start working also on what's going to replace that. And that, that's why the time is so exciting right now. There is a lot to do with what we know, but there is a lot more that we need to do to create the future. And, and, and if you don't mind, I would add to that, that many people think that a lot of what happens in this field is, is purely software driven and will be. But in fact, if one has to look at whole new computer architectures and, and, and new designs to really continue to, to, to make advances, if you really stack. think the whole stack is, is right. important, particularly when you look from neuromorphic computing <coughs> to, to quantum computing. Right. So, so um, the question for both of you, and I'll ask you first, Raphael, is in industry, we're looking at this as incredibly disruptive 
and a huge opportunity um, as every industry in the world we think is going to be transformed by this. Um, higher education is an industry. How do you think, how are you thinking about this at MIT? And then I'll ask President Jackson, how are you thinking about this emergence of this technology? What, what does it do to your curricula, your faculty, the kinds of students, um, traditional disciplines? Part A, the question is, how do you react to this? And then I'm going to come back and ask you um, only two-part question. What does it mean to education itself? How can it be turned on education to improve the learning paradigm? Well, look, I do what 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 any uh, uh, pretend smart president would do. I just follow the faculty. Whatever they say to do, I follow them. I mean, then I don't get in trouble. So, so, so look at what's going on on campus. First of all, we have a, a group of people who for a while have been thinking about human intelligence. Mm -hmm. And they are coming up with fantastic ideas that we have to figure out how to, how to implement them. So that's one thing that is already ongoing with a small group of people uh, with lots of interest from others. At the same time, our faculty are using machine intelligence tools to advance just about everything they do. I mean, they are advancing every discipline using machine learning tools. So it, it's just happening everywhere, but not everybody knows how to use it. It's still not as easy as an app. Right. Right. So, so they, they still, they still have to have some know-how, but, but the desire is there to get more action in their discipline. So I see that trend coming up in addition to that, but that's, that's, that's on the research side. In addition to that, I see departments who want to create uh, joint majors with with the AI component of CS of computer science in order to m integrate that into the curriculum. So all that is coming from from, from them, and and so my job is well. I mean, if it's I have three choices, I tolerate that. Uh, just look the other way, uh, uh, obstruct it, stop it. That's a sure thing to lose my job. And third, <laughs> to facilitate it. Sure. So what I'm doing right now is, okay, you want to do this? I, I just try, try to make it possible. So when you called me, the reason I said, let's do it fast is because yeah. I felt the pressure sure. of everybody wanting to do it. And, and the, the call from you came from heaven. <laughs> Almost New York, to be exact. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, part two, how do you? Because I think personally, I think one of the great opportunities here is actually to turn AI to increase the speed of human learning. And you have a great brain science group there, uh, <coughs> together with the computer science. But I think if we can impede and smash these machines with the human process of learning, we could actually speed up learning, learning, which would be enormous. And I know, President Jackson, you're starting to see some of this at RPI. So how can we turn this on on education itself? Well, we, we have we have two groups all from the neuroscience group. Yeah. You know, one is is trying to replicate human intelligence so that we can figure out how to build machines intelligent enough to work with us. And that's the one that I was referring to. Mm -hmm. But there are labs in the same area, in the same building. There are other people who are actually learning, uh, doing research on to learn how humans learn. It's, it's, it's a research right. on learning how to learn. How do, how do children learn? I mean, how, how do they do the things they do so quickly? Uh, and, and in so doing, we're now using, on the education part, we're using what we learn from that research to, is to teach us how do we communicate and how do we teach, not just in the classroom, but also in online approaches. Mm -hmm. so, so we're using the activities of in human intelligence to apply in these two domains, which are very much connected, but, but with different applications. Great. President Jackson, I mean, I know you, you are leading in the interdisciplinary. I mean, the fact that some of the best AI research is being done in MPAC, which you might want to explain, is, sure. is at those, that's, a, that's a bridge across the large space. Well, well, let me talk about it in, in a couple of different ways. First of all, our faculty just finished a revision to the core curriculum. Uh, you know, when you think about, you know, this kind of intelligence and a lot of it, uh, relates to being able to make some sense out of complex data sets and you know that's what you know Watson does and so forth and so uh, we've put into place an actual uh, 
curriculum requirement for data dexterity where students will have to take uh, two required courses, one that really relates to understanding uh, you know, data science, data sets and architecture, uh, data analytics, and then a second in their major, in their field of study, where they actually do an application. And so that's actually now uh, built into the curriculum. But the second has to do with the fact that given our size, and we've always had low walls, is to to look at uh, multidisciplinary approaches to uh, to learning, and so we are doing that. Uh, one example being our cognitive and immersive systems laboratory, where we, within the experimental media and performing arts center, which when we built it, people thought it was purely a performance platform, and it is a world class performance platform, but it's a research laboratory, and that allows us to create immersive spaces, uh, ones that are highly censored, have unique kinds of sensors and actuators where one can really combine, you know, aspects of machine uh, vision, uh, image processing to create uh, really interactive smart spaces, but not in the trivial sense, but where you actually have cooperating communities or hierarchies of cognitive agents, of artificially intelligent agents to, in fact, enable and and help with group learning and decision making. And so with that, we've created uh, and are creating certain use cases. So um, we call them situations rooms, uh, uh, the uh, uh, medical diagnosis rooms decision that goes decision group. spaces. But we also are using it to teach uh, new <clears throat> approaches to language that actually now, and this is what I mean by true multidisciplinarity, it brings together immersion, gamification and interaction with intelligent, these communities of agents. And we already had found that the gamification accelerates the learning, uh, you know, uh, makes it twice as fast. That can tie ultimately with the kind of fundamental research on the brain that's going on at, at places like MIT, and we're beginning to do a little of that. But 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 we're looking at you know what really happens you know in the real space. But now with the agents, one can add to the complexity of what uh, the students have to work their way through, and they are liter literally players in a semester-long narrative. And, and, and they have to move through it. And, but it helps them to uh, have uh, a better sense of cultural nuance as well as learning the, the language itself. So, so these are some of the things that, that we're doing. And, um, and we think it's pretty exciting because, you know, we have the digital natives, but I think, um, Raphael, we would agree, we don't really know what effect that has on real brain development and on cognition and learning. And we're hoping that we, we will and intend to uh, as we go along here. By the way, let me just say that I want to applaud RPI's effort with the curriculum redesign. And, and uh, what you, I think you have a, a data uh, proficiency. Is it, That's a data dexterity. That's dexterity. What we call it. I, I love it. I applaud, applaud that step. Well, as you said, this is a case of the faculty doing their thing. <laughs> <laughs> we take credit, though. Yeah, yeah we take credit. <laughs> You didn't say no. <laughs> let me so let me turn to an, another topic, um, and this is uh, partnerships, um, particularly across uh, industry, academia. You know, in in the IBM mindset, um, this is something we've always done. When when T. J. Watson Sr. formed IBM Research, he did it at Columbia University. So it's it's inherent in the way we think um, in partnering. And I, we, we think, I think our industrial research lab, which is one of the biggest and I would argue the best in the world, but anyways, is, is a good way to impedance match with researchers in, in academia. So for us, it's very a natural thing to do. Some of our competitors take a different approach, which is I'll just go in and, and t hire all your AI experts out of both your universities. And there are several that you both have that I would hire quickly, but I won't do it. It's like eating. Can't have, them. Can't have them. But I won't do it because it, it, it destroys the pipeline of talent. So from our standpoint, these kinds of partnerships are absolutely critical on the research as well as the talent pipeline versus just pulling the faculty out. How, how do each of 
you think about these partnerships, you're both extremely good at it compared to a lot of your competitors in the academic world. So, well, I would say two first. things. One, you know, the, the, the university academia partnership is to me rooted in what I call the real three-legged stool that's really powered this economy, which was really the, you know, academia industry government partnership mm -hmm. in important areas, including in computer science and and in uh, you know you could come up with any number of things, uh, fundamental work in semiconductors and uh, so on, and and things that have powered the economy for decades. Uh, alas. You know, that seems to be a bit frayed today, but <laughs> be that as it may. So how we think about uh, partnerships with uh, great uh, companies, and, and it, we've had a great history with IBM, and, and we've always uh, appreciated that, um, is, is in two ways. One, you're working at the leading edge, and, and you have some real questions and real challenges that uh, you're working through to, to do the business that you do. And those challenges, while rooted in, you could say, real world desires, present uh, unique intellectual challenges that I think uh, power uh, research ideas in the university. <clears throat> Conversely, I think companies benefit from the kind of free form research that comes out of our faculty because nobody can know. And, and sometimes I, I worry when companies say, you know, they're very kind of rigid about what they think students ought to be trained. Mm -hmm. I don't like that word, too. You know, and, and I think that's a mistake. And so I think you present the grand, the big challenges. People will figure out ways to address them. They'll find the fundamental questions in them, and they'll work on them. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, having that sort of... Uh, you know, non-directed research is how you get real breakthroughs. And, and needless to say, this is all part of creating a, a pipeline of talent as we educate the next generations. And that's what you, in the end, benefit yeah, from. That's exactly right. People talk a good game about innovation, but there's no innovation without innovators. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, um, to both of your credits, you've set uh, a tone because many universities fear working with industry, that it's somehow going to corrupt the academic freedom. So you've set the right tone uh, for doing this. Um, how do you think about these partnerships? You've got many, uh, obviously, at MIT. Well, and very much the same way as Shirley. I, you know, I think, first of all, uh, partnering with IBM is, is a no-brainer. Yes, yeah, so uh, I mean, we, 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 we learn from you. I mean, it's just, it's just you know, the, the beauty of a company like IBM is that you know what research is. You, run, you have a, a very significant research budget. You, you, you are used to that, mm -hmm. and you, are, you know how to you put research and focus and come up with service and product that people want. You know how to do both. So you understand research and you know how to fine tune it for applications. Mm -hmm. So we get we get to learn a great deal working with you and that that's that's a, a very ideal partnership. But in, in, in addition to that, I, what I can say is that uh, there is something there is something that we believe we offer you. I mean, the, the question is what is not so much what why we want to do things with you. It's more why do you want to do things with us? Because because we benefit. You do both, and we benefit from our interaction. And I think what we what, what we can offer RPI and MIT can offer you is is just think of it for a moment the following way. Institutions like ours, like RPI and MIT, academic institutions, we refresh our personnel 25% every year. Every year, a quarter of our people leave and new people come in. That's right. IBM, thank goodness, I can't really business that way. <laughs> so, so, so you have an institution that is forever young. The average age of the students is always the same. The students every year are different. That's and so, so we offer, and, and each time these students come in, they, what, they want to prove themselves. So they want to basically challenge whatever it is who was there when they arrived. So, so you have that dynamic situation with new ideas coming in every year, challenging all their ideas. And that, that's environment that, that we can offer you. So, so what we can offer is lots of exploratory work into possibilities of the future, which you do some of it as well. Yeah. But 
but at the same time you can see these these scouts going out there doing different things and you can very quickly first of all if you already did it you can tell us don't go that way because i've been there already right. without telling us exactly what you're doing and so that's the benefit we get by interacting with you so our research becomes still very exploratory but in a very very pragmatic way well this opportunity was perfect for us because we like to do this when it's a new emerging field and the number of opportunities is much bigger than we can possibly <coughs> scan even as big as we are we can't possibly scan it and i will just i'll share with all of you as we put these partnerships in place you, you talked about the pressure from the, the faculty when we put these programs in place the ideas that emerged from both of your institutions like overnight was overwhelming for us and you know that we're we're trying to keep up with the number of ideas that are coming out of both of your institutions so uh, there is this pent-up demand and I will tell you that um, I'd say three quarters of what came out of those proposals and ideas we had not been exploring at all so this is this is wonderful for us uh to go into these areas so let me ask one more question and then i want to open it up for, for everyone here um what are your wildest dreams and to be a little controversial your wildest fears about artificial oh, intelligence <laughs> <laughs> she says you're gonna start <laughs> What, what does this technology behold for us in the next 5, 10, and perhaps 20, 25 you mean years? Fears? Uh, fears? Opportunities? You know, what would you love to see happen, and what would you really hate to see happen? Well, I think the opportunities are, are just enormous. Are, are just enormous. I think, let me just give you an example of how, how, how we view this. There is, a, there is lots of studies out there by different institutions, and which they call the future of work. Mm. And, and people are addressing it and studying about and concern about it. And, and, and of course, there should be that concern. I mean, there is AI will bring automation, automation will just displace jobs, all that is true. But we are doing that study too, but we don't call it the future of work because that seems to suggest that there may not be any work in the future, that machines will replace us. And we just simply don't believe that. In fact, what we're calling it is the work of the future which means there will be work, it just will be different. And I think the only situation is from the world of today and the world of five and 10 and 20 years from now is how are we gonna be able to use machines to help us, to help us do a better job of what we're doing, but not to worry that they will replace us because they will not. The issue is that there will be plenty of jobs but they will be very different from today's. And, and, as a, and we have to work with society and with the private sector to figure out how to prepare society for that transition. So, so I'm not, the fear is that we are not doing that very well. As a society, we, we can worry about this, surely can worry about that at RPI, but it takes more than a few institutions to think about it. It's a whole ecosystem to prepare our society for that. In terms of dreams, um, I mean, my dream is your dream, John, because you have IBM Watson right here. I think, I think the, the Watson Health, what, what AI will do f for society, but let's focus on health, will be tremendous. I think two areas that we are very focused on campus are medical domains in which AI will help tremendously, which is another reason why I'm so excited about our collaboration, our partnership. We have quite a few people working on trying to diagnose, detect disease before symptoms occur. Not when it's late, not when it already has shown up, but before it occurs. And, and even if we knew how to do that today, we don't know what to do with it because we don't have therapies when you detect diseases that early. So that's a whole new domain in which AI will play mm -hmm. a significant role. And, and that also includes uh, how to, the, the biggest issue we are going to be facing as a society again, as other countries are facing it, each generation in America lives longer than the previous one, has been like that for generations. 
Well, we're getting an age in which that may not happen, or it, it, it will continue to happen, but, but, but what's going to catch us is our, is our, our aging minds. So we, we may believe longer, yes, but at some point, our aging mind will not allow us to enjoy that longer life. So we have to address that too. And that, that's another approach to think about how to detect things before symptoms occur. To me, and we have seen already evidence of that, I mean, I, I can give you examples of that, how people have been using AI machine right. learning to do exactly that. So that's, that's, that to me is a dream that should come true within 20 years. I expect that to happen. Yeah, one of the projects that we're working on in healthcare with MIT and, and the Broad Institute, which is a partnership between MIT and, and Harvard, is, is well, it's, 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 it's really MIT, um, is the whole, the whole issue of reoccurrence of cancer. Um, yeah. After treatment with chemo, radiation, surgery, 80% of the time the cancer comes back. And we're now doing a, I think, a seminal study in genomics of how those mutations are occurring. The amount of data we're collecting off of 10,000 people surpasses what you can do with anything other than AI. And the, the plot here is we believe that we will be able to measure and predict the mutation of every cancer cell and therefore at time zero cut off all mutations so that there's not a reoccurrence of cancer. And I was saying to Raphael earlier, I think this problem is solvable. I think we're gonna get it. I don't know exactly when, but it's a kind of partnership where you've got a lot of the capability and the sequencing capability and the world's best genomics experts, and we have one heck of a smart machine. So this is, to me, one of my dreams is to cut off cancer reoccurrence. President Jackson. Well, I think you, you have to start. Biggest fear you're well, I, I, let me start fear. with the, the, the hope and, and the dream. And I think it, it rests with what I call the place where challenges come to ground. So, so a lot obviously rests in the, the healthcare arena, particularly with aging populations, with things like neurodegenerative diseases. <clears throat> but, you know, we had a faculty member in our biomedical engineering department who was able to um, do, you know, use uh, data analytics and so on and take uh, uh, things he learned about uh, from blood metabolites to be able to predict if and where on the autism spectrum a child might end up. So you talk about prediction before right. the disease really manifests. And, and I think those kinds of things are, are, are so important. In addition, we've had the genomics and are in the middle of it still, the genomics revolution. But you know, humans are complex. So the whole issue of uh, the microbiome, mm. the, the uh, you know, and how it intersects uh, with the larger uh, environment is something I think, and, and how that manifests in terms of uh, uh, genetic changes, mutations, I don't think we really understand. And so that's going to take a lot of computational power, not just in the the uh, punch and crunch sense, but, but in the sense of the application of powerful AI techniques and, mm -hmm. and so on. But then there are lots of other issues having to do with uh, climate change. And, and weather patterns with uh, managing water resources. And we have the Jefferson Project that we do with IBM with infrastructure and, and, and how we design it, what kinds of materials, substitutional materials, how we monitor it, how do we manage it. And, and, and therefore, you know, the whole issue of sensors and sensor networks. And these are very practical things, so, but, but some of them have a longer term. And so that allows me to deal with the fear. So, so my fear has to do with fear itself, meaning that uh, people are so worried about what may happen in terms of uh, job displacement, about, you know, the power of, you know, an intelligent, uh, artificially intelligent entity or entities, that it can stop societal acceptance of, of, of where we need to go. And, and all technologies sit on a knife edge, and, and it really is a function of what we do with them. 
and, and how we educate uh, students from an ethical perspective as well. Um, but in the end, I actually think, uh, because it's always hard to predict, uh, there's going to be an explosion of new types of things that people will do. And that's where the jobs will come from. Mm -hmm. You know, there's always been, uh, you know, advances uh, with manufacturing, for instance, and you displace oh, jobs, oh, but oh, other things mm -hmm. come to being. And so I think our discussion has to focus on where our greatest challenges are. And you've talked a lot about things in healthcare, but you can look across a broader fruited plane. And that's where the applications and the advances in these technologies can make a difference. And because that's how we live and where we live, then that's where the jobs will be. Mm -hmm. So that's my thought. I absolutely agree. And one, one of the, um, the projects that's got me most excited is some of the work that you're doing at Rensselaer in these immersive environments and how learning seems to be being accelerated right. when this man-machine interface is optimized at scale. And if, if we can if we can do that and accelerate human learning at anything like the speed these machines are learning, this is a big paradigm shift. Okay, let me open it up. I'm sure Thank you you know. <laughs> I've, I've got them warmed up. They're they're all yours. I think we might have a couple of mics uh, in the aisle. If not, just sp speak up. Okay. But there are a couple of mics. I'll so give it one minute. Uh, Paul, you want or. Whoever gets it first will. Yeah. Paul? So, uh, thanks so much. I, I actually have a, a question about artificial intelligence and um, not about healthcare. But um, we're very bad at, at, as a society, at understanding risk. People focus on airplane crashes and, um, and Chinese uh, space stations falling out of the sky and things that are very unlikely to be, but, but are big headline events. So in that, in that context, we have a societal problem with artificial intelligence. We know that today we don't have a car that's capable of autonomous driving. We know that in the future, there are going to be cars that are far better than human beings that are autonomous driving. How do we get from here to there without shutting down the program when the first, I mean, someone has been killed now, but it's going to happen again and again. But as it turns out, in the end, it's going to, the cars are going to kill far fewer people with, with computers driving them than people driving them. But how do we as a society figure that out and let it happen, let machines actually have the opportunity? opportunity to be better than us? It's sort of well, I think it's, it's a question of how the, the, uh, the challenge is framed. And, you know, as you know, uh, on the way to the moon, uh, people died. And even after we went, people died. But people were very uh, motivated by uh, exploring space. Uh, both in the sense of um, increasing human understanding, but also uh, the grand challenge it represented. And I think it requires a national conversation and leadership to have people understand the grand challenge. People need things to look to. And, and, and so we tend to get caught today in every little thing. And... And so I, uh, Ron McNair, who died in the Space Shuttle Challenger event and is a, actually was a friend of mine and, and a PhD graduate from MIT, and, and he came in and, and was kind of my protege in a way, um, you know, always told me that he knew he was pressing the edge of the envelope um, in being an astronaut. But when he got up into space, <laughs> it allowed him to see how small the world really is. And that was transformative for him in his life. But he nonetheless felt it was so important to do that. And he was inspired by that uh, challenge even before he went into space. And so we've got to be able to start talking in a larger way. I mean, that sounds trivial, but um, and then the, the real issue about risk is, and you know, I was chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, so I have to think about it all the time. 
that you know risk is a convolution of of uh, probability and consequence, and uh, you know there are things that have very small probability but can have huge consequence, but there are things that have larger probability but the consequence is not so great. So so the question becomes, you know, having helping people to understand that, and so rather than play into the, the people's concerns, I think we have to try to, those of us who understand it better, need to shift the conversation. That's all. That's my thought. Well, I, I, I have nothing to add. That's, that's a, uh, not only a, a great answer, but a beautiful answer as well. Yes. So, you talk about interdisciplinary. So you talked about interdisciplinary education, which is, of course, very important. And AI is not a field that's exactly a walk in the park. You need to have a number of years of schooling. And yet what I see is students coming out of college with a lot of loans, and then they get very attractive offers from people like IBM and a number of other people we won't mention, and they don't go to grad school. So they, so you know, to do interdisciplinary work, you need more than one discipline. You need to go further. How do we, how do we keep the pipeline going? I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take the tough questions and alternate. <laughs> Rafael, you want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Yeah. That's a difficult question. I think, uh, in many ways, in many ways, um, American institutions of higher education have benefited from immigration, from grad students from abroad, uh, because the pipeline has been trying for quite a while, and um, and there is some some risk and dangers that come to that with with, with that with that approach. And, and but even that's been the challenge right now with the the new uh, narrative from from Washington. So so I think we have we have an issue there, but I don't have a solution for it. Surely does. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the, the truth be told, in a way, uh, Rafael and I are in unfair positions in that the graduates of our institutions tend to do uh, well economically, whether they, you know, go to work in, in uh, for the IBMs of the world or they become entrepreneurs. But, but our graduates go across a range of professions, including uh, public service and the military and so forth. And so uh, we think we educate our students to be able to handle it, but it is a national problem that doesn't have an easy answer. But again, and, and this may sound more abstract than I mean it, but we do have to have a national conversation about what the value of higher education is because it's not exactly easy and cheap to have the kind of faculty that Raphael has at, at MIT or that that uh, we have at, at, at Rensselaer. Uh, that uh, it's an expensive education, but I also happen to believe that liberal arts education uh, has an important role. And so, if we then value something as a society, we need to support it. Because, for instance, you know, many of our great public universities are, are having a tough time because uh, people won't fund it, to the, the legislatures. But the legislatures are reflective of us. And then there are those with the private universities that, that won't support them. Now, if the university happens to have a large endowment already, that's a good thing. But if they don't, and people don't see that, you know, that it is a worthwhile thing to support, then we end up in a similar kind of situation. So it's not a question that one can answer just in one spot. It has to do with our whole value system about how we see higher education because it does have to get paid for and it, it can't and shouldn't all come from a tuition charge but at the same time the support has to come from a broader frame now the truth be told however 
for most universities and most major universities, and that includes <clears throat> ours, the price is not the cost. And, and so uh, that gets offset with financial aid and, and other things. And so, but, but, but it still relates back to this question of, of our fundamental values about the value of, of higher education. But, but be that as it may, um, you know, our graduates, they go off and, and they do work. Not, they certainly will go work for the IBMs and the Googles and the so on, but they also work across a much broader frame and contribute to society in a range of ways. Yeah, I would just add, you know, from the industry uh, standpoint, and in a sense, you know, we're the customer of the products, is um, we're, we're less interested in what's their terminal degree. Did they go into grad school or what specific discipline? We're more interested in, out of these two institutions, they get one heck of a base of understanding. And out of both of these institutions, the people tend to be very agile and and lifelong learners and i can relate to that i mean what i do today is totally different than what i did two years ago and it's a heck of a lot different than what i did starting in ibm in 1980 out of rensselaer um, so with the right foundational education interdisciplinary capabilities um, that base is more important than actually the specifics of what they do and what they end up doing over time at more value to us. Next question. Yes. Thank you. Um, very interesting. The promise of AI, in, especially in terms of uh, solving health problems or geopolitical or you know uh, water and resource problems, is very exciting. But there's also the the trade off with privacy. And you know, recently this week, of course, with Mark Zuckerberg and uh, the Senate, you know, you hear about the trade off all the time with using data to customize for solutions for people, but that data can sometimes be used in bad ways. I'm curious in all of your perspectives on what's the responsibility to manage that privacy and what and how do we handle it in a way to get those benefits but to also protect the individual rights well I'll, st I'll start that one and then i would really like both your perspectives at, at least in ibm we have a stated policy and and we enforce this to the nines which is your data is your data and we will not share it with anyone else unless you let us and we make the the terms of that very visible Number one. Number two is we say, if we use artificial intelligence on your data in a decision making, we will tell you. And not only will we tell you that we're using artificial intelligence, we'll tell you what kind of artificial intelligence, and we'll tell you how that machine was trained. Because the decision or the recommendation that machine is, is giving to uh, someone operating a nuclear plant or um, healthcare, that decision is only as good as the training. And so we will tell you that you know this Watson Oncology was trained by Memorial Sloan Kettering with these techniques on these data sets, and we will protect your individual data. So I think increasingly data security and privacy and fencing that data and transparency around the use of that data, simple transparency, is going to become uh, the coin here. So, so, so my belief is that <clears throat> You know what? What has to happen because you don't you don't want to end up over regulating here. <coughs> but I think it rests in three things: uh, disclosure, a la transparency, affirmative choice, and risk informed decision making. Now, what do I mean by that? That uh, People should understand what they are giving and, and, and be told, because most people are not going to necessarily have great awareness of it, you know, what they're giving up or, or what is tracked or, or whatever. Secondly, that they get to make an affirmative choice in, in terms of sharing that data. And then the third is uh, being a, a made aware of, of along the lines that John discussed of how that data is used and, and therefore to be able to s discern risks for themselves and or their reputations or, you know, their privacy. And, and, and that's, that's not something that was built in from the beginning. 
So we're trying to backfit it. And when backfitting occurs, people try to think of legislation and regulation. And I say that as a regulator, but I always say that you have to have uh, informed, risk-informed regulation, that you have to have disclosure and transparency, and you have to have affirmative decision-making. Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> Hello. Um, so I'm a graduate of RPI 1982, and um, I'm here with my lovely wife, who went to a far less prestigious institution, also on the Charles. I won't say which one. Uh, its name begins with an H and ends with a D. <laughs> but when we were dating, a few years ago. You came to MIT. <laughs> she works for MIT now, uh, but went to another institution. But when we were dating in Cambridge, right around the corner from here, there was something called AI Alley. I don't know if anyone remembers AI Alley here, but it was termed that because these artificial intelligence uh, industry companies spun up and quickly spun down. And it was just a complete bust. So what is the one thing today that makes this next cycle of AI different? So if you're an investor or you know, you're a, your kid is just graduated from college, is looking for a job, what makes this field, um, why do you think it'll be successful this time around? Well, I'll, I'll answer from the industry standpoint, at least from an IBM standpoint, because we're betting the ranch on this. We're betting the ranch on this. So in our in our view, what's different now than at that time is number one, I think President Jackson said we now have the compute power to do AI. We did not have it back in those even in the eighties. Weren't even close. Uh, in fact in when we did Watson Jeopardy, it was a pivot point because we knew exactly how much compute power we needed and that was the exact point in time when we had it to be able to do natural language at that level. So compute power. The second is the world's data wasn't digitized back in those days. Right. And now it is digitized. And we have the connectivity through the internet and other areas that we have the fuel for it. And then the third is the algorithms themselves in AI, the deep neural networks and some of the transfer learning techniques are way beyond what they were back in those days. So that perfect storm of compute power, world's data digitized, and advances from institutions like this in AI, machine learning, deep neural network algorithms says that this is for real. The economic opportunity we estimate in the world just in decision support of humans is $2 trillion. So that's a number that gets even our attention. It's a big opportunity, but this, this is a Sometime in the 2010-11 time frame, all these things converged at once to say, now it's real. And of course, we're not the only ones that realize that, which is why there's four to six billion dollars of VC money going into AI and other, other things. But you know. gotta be careful that people aren't playing trivial games. That's right. The, the game stuff is over. This is like serious. We left games behind and we're now doing oncology. Uh, would you agree? Uh, just about, uh, no, I, I, think, I, I agree with you. I just I see more hands. So I, I think okay. we'll, we'll get more questions. Yes. But... Uh, Sir. She's going to give you a mic. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll, we'll sit down in no chair. <laughs> um, can you give us a sense on the decision making? And this, my question is actually maybe directed to IBM and industry in general. Um, the decision making process in selecting which projects, AI projects to go after and kind of where would you like to go to next? Hmm. So we have um, sort of two criteria. One is, and it sort of gets back to Raphael's earlier description of us, is we'll see industry problems that are big um, opportunities for us where there's tremendous waste that these systems can help with or there's tremendous opportunity to reduce errors in you know cancer diagnosis or something so we see it through an industry lens and and things that are in those industries and segments are things that we're very interested in 
And then the second is more just from a pure technology. You know, we know how to build neural networks very deep. We know how to do some level of transfer learning. But what's the next round of algorithms in machine learning or neural networks or beyond that that we need? Because we're thinking about this as a, you know, not a couple of year thing or even a 10 year thing. This is going to be a 50 year minimum journey in AI. And I need my partners here out, you know, mowing the lawn and, and exploring out there before I even get there from an industry standpoint. So long range technology and then through these industry sorts of lenses. Uh, let's go way over in the corner. This oh, awesome. <clears throat> uh, so I'll start off saying thank you. It's great to hear you guys talk about artificial intelligence and a really casual and, and uh, conversations full of humor, which is great and very much appreciated. The, the question I have is directed towards some of the comments made about transparency and Dr. Jackson's comment on fear or fear itself. So as both institutions, and I'm an RPI grad of 2015, so only a few years out, both institutions are focusing on the cutting edge of cognition and computation and i see those i see that in one direction as pushing forward but as we start to think about mitigating fear with transparency that can only go so far with people who already know about the type of math and computation that goes into deep learning how embedded is the perspective of equipping yes yeah, right word equipping humans with human in the loop machine learning and artificial intelligence solutions and focusing on efforts that integrate human actions that can be automated to a large extent um, to support existing uh, job functions and families. Well, one could argue that the, and, and I would say this is at the root of it, uh, I mentioned the cognitive and immersive systems laboratory, and, and it is uh, meant to do just that. It is meant to be an enhancement to uh, human uh, decision making in the presence of human interaction and, and discussion and learning. And, and so the human is very much part of the whole thing. So it's not in lieu of the human, it is with the human. But it also is meant to not just be the, the unitary single person, but to actually be part of a group dynamic. So you're bringing people together to share their perspectives, intelligences, uh, you know, questions, et cetera. And so that's precisely what we're trying to do. Well, thank you for that question. Yeah. It's good. In a, in a related, and, and I'll ask both of you to comment on this, you know, and it, it sort of is an extension of your question, which is um, we're now starting to get to the, the, the leading edge of ethical questions with these systems. And um, I feel there was some great work recently at MIT to show that these AI systems will develop biases depending on what data they were given. And we, we know, for instance, when we trained Watson for Oncology, that demo you saw, we went to Memorial Sloan Kettering because they, we felt that was the most reliable source of training. But these machines will, like humans, develop a bias based on what data they have seen. So, you know, a, a real live ethical question is, and when we start to see a bias, do we reverse bias the system? What data do we enter into the system and who has the right to do that? So, I mean, these are questions that, like with any technology, we're just starting to get at. And I know both of you in your education and in your institutions not only are pushing the technology, but the ethics and the, the liberal arts and how do we think about these things. That's a huge issue and one that we're ad addressing right now as well. I think, l l let me just make a statement that I think is pretty much universal. I, I think technologies or innovations reflect the values of the humans that innovate. 
So, so, and that means reflect the biases of the humans that innovate too. So I think you have to start with the humans. You have to start with the innovators. And, and, and these kinds of technologies have the potential of uh, automate cars to do things that reflect the values of the person who does the automation. And, and that, 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 that means that we have to pay a great deal of attention on how to bring that concept into the education of the future innovators. And, and that is the job of institutions like RPI and MIT to integrate that seamlessly in the way we educate. It's not, it's not a crash course you take, it's not something you just learn overnight. Uh, you know, Shirley and I know very well that biases do exist and how to, how to you, you don't, it's very hard to unbias a piece of software. Uh, it's much easier to try to unbias the individual who's going to write that piece of software. And that's a process that, that has taken a long time in America, and uh, it's, uh, we're not done with that yet. So it's a, it's a huge issue. But I have seen examples of how that manifests itself. And that part, that part is the one that creates fear in me. I mean, that part is the one that I don't know how much we can educate individuals that innovate in a way that benefits society. Uh, so that's an issue that we have to pay attention to. Is education is the part of the answer. Great. I agree, but, but it also goes back to this gentleman's uh, question over there. And, and so if you go back to the fact that, that the technologies or any inherent biases in them reflect the biases of the individuals who develop them, that's why it's important that for important decisions, one, you have group decision making. Two, that you bring in uh, multiple perspectives. And so the teams that are come to, you know, come together uh, and, and that includes teams that come to together to develop th these new technologies, the software that drives them, are in fact diverse teams. And so, you know, that's why it's important that, that the universities themselves who are educating uh, the next generations of innovators in these arenas, in fact, are deliberate about bringing people together in these ways. Secondly, uh, the, the other piece is somewhat of a technological answer, which is we've not really developed reasoning. We call them cognitive systems, but they don't really reason. You can have a system that can recognize a, a child, a, a cat, and a ball, uh, or you know, a toy of some other toy. But then if there was some crisis and one or more had to be sacrificed, is the machine capable of saying that it should not be the child? But then in another culture, it might be the cat. So, <laughs> so you know, it, it, it's humorous, but, but it's, it's real. It's real. And, and so that's why it is important. To, to have uh, diverse perspectives, experiences, uh, backgrounds of people coming together as the technologies are being developed and because it has two functions. One, uh, because of the sort of give and take, the product that comes out can be different. But secondly, it also helps to educate people to the fact that you know, different people have contributions to make. Well, look, uh, I think we could go on for uh, quite some more time, but I want to respect everyone's time. Um, we, we're going to wrap here. Uh, we're going to be open for another hour or so with the demos for anything you haven't seen. Uh, at 8.15 is the last uh, tour or demonstration uh, up on the third floor of the Cyber Command Center. You can see what happens when AI meets cybersecurity. Um, We'll show you enough that it'll cause you to think, but we won't show you so much that you won't be able to sleep tonight so, <laughs> at this hour. But please enjoy it. But I would like to ask you all to join me in thanking the two presidents for a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.